awakened on my birthday earlier this month by a phone call informing me that my favorite living singer, Marvin Gaye, had been shot dead. Many Radio 1 listeners shared my feeling of great loss and have communicated it in letters and poems. It is for them, and in tribute to a giant talent of our times, that we rebroadcast two hour-long interviews recorded in late 1976. I spoke with my hero in the Carlton Tower Hotel in London. I was initially disappointed to find his speech slightly slurred and subdued. But then I noticed that his low-key approach was concealing a treasure of historical and anecdotal material. Marvin was so forthcoming that Radio 1 abandoned its initial plan for an hour-long show and aired two separate programs. We hear the first today. The second will follow this time next week. It's back to 1976 we go. Like any dutiful young interviewer, I began at the beginning. I believe you started off in a group called the Rainbows. Is that correct? Well, I'm sure Don Covey enjoyed that. But I don't think they accepted me as a member of the group. And uh, that sort of became, you know, I tried out for the group. You know, and Don likes to say, oh, yes, Marvin was one of the... But he turned me down. <laughs> so I auditioned for the Rainbow. It would be a far more accurate statement. So therefore, the Moon Glows would have been your first uh, hit at the big time. Yeah, I would, I would say so. In fact, I, I'm sure I'd say so, because that's what it was. And... Uh, we were singing at that time with a group called the Marquis and not doing very well. And Harvey thought that our sound was very closely related to the Moonglow sound at the time. And that's why he chose us to uh, fill in for the members who had departed. Actually, when Barry Gordy was starting Motown, didn't Harvey Fuqua have a financial interest in one of the labels? Harvey had more than a financial interest in one of the labels. But uh, that's another story. Yes, um, he um, and uh, Gwendolyn Fuqua, Barry Gordy's uh, sister, were married, husband and wife, and they had a record company called tri -Fi Records, uh, uh, which Barry Gordy ultimately bought out, and, uh, and tri -Fi merged with the Gordy label. Now, was it Harvey or Anna who brought you to Barry well, I I would imagine I would imagine it was Harvey and Gwen and Anna and um, Providence. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't go for it for for an audition. I stopped auditioning when I was a very young artist. I, how dare me not audition to as a young artist? But I refused to audition. Barry had to hear me at a nightclub because I wouldn't audition for him. And I, I think he thought that was rather rash of me. So he finally said, maybe, well, maybe I should go hear the guy who won't audition for him. <laughs> was Sandman the first single? Probably was. Uh, I think a thing called Let Your Conscience Be a Guy was the first thing. It was a horrible song on the record. Barry wrote it, by the way. He'll probably say I wrote some horrible ones in this next interview, so that's okay. first mentor with the successful records was William Stevenson, who mm -hmm. did not turn out to be one of the major figures of the Motown era at its peak. What was it like working with him? Mentor. Is that anything like Tormentor? That's up for you to answer. I don't know that word. But anyway, <laughs> the first uh, two records he did with you, Stubborn Kind of Fella and Hitchhike, were very uh, exciting vocals and arrangements. And they featured interplay vocally between you and uh, a backing chorus. Was that a style which you brought to your sessions, or was it one which was presented to you? Well, I must say, you know, with um, all the um, humility that anybody can have, making one of these, um, <laughs> making one of these ego-filled statements that that was all my genius at the time. <laughs> I, you know, what can I tell you? He's <laughs> not good. Except, you know, you don't get a very, you don't get a lot of chance to express it either. I mean, you know, not publicly. Your name doesn't go down and all that. But 
you know, I, I would imagine I helped the producers as much as, as anybody. I was young and, and raw, but um, we worked together, but I had a lot of ideas, and uh, they used them freely, and I didn't uh, mind. Sometimes hear of people in the Motown family of artists doing background work on the other people's records. Were any of the backup singers on those records, for example, Martha Reeves, as I once heard? I think that I can say with great warmth and feeling that I am the only Motown artist on the entire label in the stable who has had every act background singing on some occasion. And uh, I can just name the records for you, but. It turns out that the only act that hasn't background me on occasion, and the only ones that haven't, I've had some members of the group singularly sing on some of the stuff in some instance, or, and uh, the only act might have been the Elgins, but every major act, I would think, uh, has uh, appeared in a background capacity, and I don't say that, you know, with anything on it, but... In those days, we all worked with each other with love, and uh, I worked just as hard on the drums and the piano with every other act. But I like that distinction. I, I was thinking about that the other day, you know? The, the Supremes, the Temps, Gladys Knight, Miracles. Some part of every group has participated on some record, some recording of mine, especially in the early years, the 60s. Pride and Joy was actually your first top ten hit, um, which Stubborn Kind of Fella and Hitchhike had not been able to attain. Did that change your life professionally at all? No, Pride and Joy didn't change anything. There was still a struggling period during those years, and I don't view them uh, with a lot of happiness, you know, because there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of pain um, trying to figure being young and not knowing the business a great deal, trying to figure things out. And nobody told you a lot. Nobody tells you a lot nowadays. You know, it's part of the business. You can't talk a lot to the explosables. <laughs> Did uh, Smokey Robinson bring you out much as he did work with you on two of your big ones, Ain't That Peculiar and I'll Be Doggone? Smokey saved me during a time when I was non-productive and not even thinking about producing or not even giving producing myself a second thought, although I was writing strong, but I didn't have a great deal of confidence in my pen at the time because the Giants were around Holland Dozier and Whitfield and Smokey was a legend even in those days. So it was difficult for me to have a lot of confidence in my own pen. And um, Smokey saved me during a period that I needed some some records, you know. He saved me. Does he know you feel this way about him? Probably not. But that's true. I mean, he doesn't solicit my feelings, so <laughs> he wouldn't know. We're good friends, and we respect each other a great deal. So I would think that he knows, he senses, you know. It was in uh, 1964, I believe, that you had the double-sided duet hit with Mary Wells. And this was the first of the duets that you would have through the years. Um, whose idea was that, to team you up like that? I wasn't very happy with a, a, a lot of the decisions that were made about my career in the early years, but I should have been, as it has proven out, and very appreciative, in fact, as I am now. But at the time, I was most rebellious to a lot of decisions made like those, or a decision like that. Nothing personal, of course, 
that they uh, my singing partners, but I, you know, I wasn't very happy, of course. I think they were great decisions now. But there was Barry Gordy's um, idea. At the time, I remember that Mary Wells was the only female artist, and you were the only male artist who actually had greatest hits collections on Motown, so perhaps it was strictly a commercial decision. I'm sure it was, as most decisions are rendered by a record company, except those who aren't commercial-minded, which I don't know any of those. Are you not uh, satisfied with the actual songs themselves, say, What's the Matter With You, Baby? Well, I wasn't satisfied with my performances on them. I, uh, I, I couldn't sing in those early years. I, I think I'm 50% improved as a singer now. And uh, I didn't think I sang very well in those years. Of course, I was pure, pure, because I, I was younger. And you could probably sense that there was something happening with Marvin Gaye's voice. Because every now and then, a little purity would come through. And you say, well, that wasn't bad. The kid had a chance. But um, I think I sing much better now than I did in those days. So I wasn't happy with my performance, no. but. Uh, there was nothing personal with regard to Mary Wells. She's a great girl, and uh, she should have been popular even now, and maybe singing even now, but um, poor management. And you also had solo hits, uh, late 63, Can I Get a Witness, and then later on, Baby, Don't You Do It, with Holland Dozier Holland themselves, who you previously have mentioned. I was wondering, did you feel like you were being shifted from one producer to another? Well, I not only felt like I was being shifted, but uh, I felt like I was being puppete puppeteered or whatever expression might be. And I got into quite a few arguments. I remember one where Brian Holland and I got into quite an altercation because I wasn't ready to go down and sing. You know, I I should have been ready because the time was set and all and everything, and I should have gone, but I was doing something else that was of little consequence to what was really important. And I remember he went and told Barry on me, and Barry came and, you know, he chewed me out pretty good about it, and I got mad. And Barry got mad, and we all had a vicious argument, and it was awful. And then we nearly had a fight, and, and Brian and I nearly had a fight. And <laughs> Do you remember what the song was? Yeah, it was, um, I'll Take Care of You. I don't know if you remember it. I'll Take Care of You. It was a good song. Eddie wrote it. What it amounted to was, um, I wasn't so mad at Brian because of that, but that was a very necessary thing because it catapulted me into my own individual, individualness, and it made me very independent of them, and it caused me to become conscious of the fact that I had some ability to produce. And that's when I started seriously thinking about producing myself. Mm -hmm. 